Hi, this is Tucker with your SAT vocabulary list number three. Please take Cornell notes, write down the word, the part of speech, the definition, and any examples that I say or that you think of that will help you to remember these words. And remember, if at any point I'm going too fast, feel free to pause the recording so that you can catch up. The first word is abduction, and this is a noun, and it means carrying away of a person against his or her will or illegally. Now, often abduction can actually refer to more than just people, um, but that's the, the strict definition. To abduct is the verb form of this. So if you've ever been on the freeway, you might have noticed those huge signs. Oftentimes there'll be what's called an amber alert, where basically that huge freeway sign has a notice saying a child was abducted, look for this color car, this make and model, and this license plate, because a child has been taken against their will or illegally. But you might also hear the word abduction when referencing you know, a missing animal. Like there's been an abduction of a cat in our neighborhood. And so everybody's thinking that somebody came and took this cat as opposed to the cat wandering off or something else happening to them. Two is altruism. And altruism is a noun. It means benevolence to others on subordination to self-interest, which is kind of a highfalutin definition. Basically what that means is you're generous with other people and as a result, you don't have as much, or it's maybe against your best interest or your self-interest to be so generous, yet you are generous. So when you think about people who demonstrate altruism and they give a lot to their communities, to their family, sometimes they they do that and maybe they don't get as much sleep as they need. Or maybe they give away money that they could be spending in other places. Those would be acts of altruism. So an example might be somebody like Bill Gates. Bill and Melinda Gates have their own foundation. Now they have a ton of money, but they give a lot of money away. And they could keep that money if they wanted and do whatever they want with their own money. Yet they've set up their foundation to try to fund programs in education and other areas of interest for them. And so they, that would be... Their, their foundation, the money that they give away, would definitely be considered acts of altruism. The third word is bravado, and bravado is a noun. It's an aggressive display of boldness. It, you can think of, you know, somebody who's kind of just swaggering. They almost like a ridiculous display of courage. Um, I think of the word brave to help me remember the word bravado, but the word brave has much more positive connotations than the word bravado. Bravado is almost being brave to the point of foolishness. And so when I saw this picture, <laughs> this little girl like up in this pony's face, uh, I thought of the word bravado, right? Because she's clearly very courageous, yet it's a little foolish. Like this pony is unpredictable. It could like snap at her. Um, and she, you know, she has no idea what this little pony is capable of. They actually can be quite irritable little animals. So um, I would say this moment, it, she's displaying bravado. Four is exacerbate. And when you exacerbate a situation, you make it worse. So it's a verb, and it means to make more sharp, severe, virulent, or violent. So I always imagine like a teenager having an argument with a parent. If you're that teenager and you roll your eyes or you talk back, you are exacerbating the situation. You are only going to make that situation worse. And some people act out violently when they're upset, so they might dig their pencil into their smartphone just because they're so angry or they might punch their hand through a wall. But what have you really achieved? You've just made a bad situation worse. You've exacerbated it. Five is fallacy. And a fallacy, it's a noun. It's any unsound or kind of delusional reasoning. So for years and years and years, people believed that the world was flat. It was a very popular fallacy. When people realized that it was round, then clearly they realized that their previous assumptions, their previous reasoning was incorrect. But for a long time, people believed that the world was flat, so it was a popular fallacy. Growing up, I think about all of the different fallacies that I believed were true until I realized they weren't. We used to go to Disneyland a couple times every year when I was young. I lived in LA, and I remember thinking that the abominable snowman 
in the Matterhorn was real. And it wasn't until I got a little old, older that I realized this was a fallacy. It was not accurate. My reasoning was fairly delusional and came from a place of fear. Number six, inconceivable. Anyone who read The Princess Bride or has seen the movie knows this word, but I'll break it down. The, the prefix at the beginning, in, means not. And then the word conceivable, if you can conceive something, you can imagine it. You can, you can believe it. If something is inconceivable, it is beyond conceiving. It is beyond believing or, or being able to be imagined. It is incomprehensible. So describe something that is incomprehensible. You can't even comprehend. You can't even conceive of it. This, this expression on this child's face cracks me up. I can just imagine somebody saying something and this little girl, who probably can't even speak yet, throwing her hands on her head and just saying, inconceivable. It would make a hilarious commercial to see this child like say that in this moment. Talisman is a noun and it's a lucky charm. In the past, often a talisman was like a stone or a ring or an object that would have an engraving or images or characters on it and was said to possess some kind of magical powers, like a charm. Now it's kind of generally used to describe something that's considered a lucky charm. So some people might consider a rabbit's foot a talisman. Some people might consider a dream catcher a talisman, right? It catches the bad dreams, it's good luck, it helps you sleep monotonous. Think of mono meaning one. Monotonous is when something is always the same. It's unchanging and because it's always the same, because it doesn't change, it tends to be really tedious. So you describe things that are monotonous as boring, tedious, the same. So if you go to school every single day and you have a class where the class never changes, it's the same routine every day, that might feel kind of monotonous. You might be wishing that that teacher would do some new activities and just change it up so it didn't feel like every day was the same. Nine is pastoral. This describes anything that has the spirit or the sentiment of rural life, life in the country. I like to think of the word pasture, kind of reminds me of being out in fields and country and helps me remember the definition. Um, so even some genres of literature have kind of pastoral elements. So for example, Jane Austen tended to set her books, in her novels, in pastoral kinds of settings out in the country in England. 10 is recoil, and it's a verb, and it means to start back. And start back meaning kind of like to almost like jump back or to be startled in dismay, loathing, like hatred, or dread. And that's so the action of recoiling is this movement kind of backwards because you're in dismay or you loathe something or you're afraid of it or you're dreading something. Oftentimes we hear the word, word recoil when we think of a, a snake. So if you're just walking along a path, you're taking a hike up in Annadale and you see a snake in the road or in the, the, the path, you're going to recoil. You're going to jump back because it's going to startle you. It's going to make you afraid. Sagacious describes any one or any person or thing that's able to discern or distinguish with wise perception. I would just say someone who is sagacious is very wise. So oftentimes we'll think of older people who have a lot of life experience as sagacious. Or if we don't, we absolutely should because they've lived so many years. They know a lot about the world. They have a lot of wisdom. They're able to perceive things on a deeper level. Oftentimes religious icons or figures are also considered sagacious. People go seeking kind of that, that wisdom, that wisdom of, per of perception. 12 is hamper, and not like a, a laundry hamper. This is SAT vocabulary. So this is a verb that means to hold back, to hinder, to impede, progress. So if you have a big barbecue planned with your friends outside and it's been beautiful all week and then Saturday it rains, that's going to hamper your plans, right? It's going to make it hard for you to have a beautiful barbecue outside. You're going to have to figure something else out. If you're on a road trip and you run into traffic or construction, that will also hamper your progress. 
13 is tranquil, and something that is tranquil is calm. So it describes anything that's calm. Some people are just naturally very tranquil. I am not, but some people are. You can also think of things like water as being very tranquil. So if you're at Lake Sonoma and you want to go wakeboarding, you're probably hoping that the lake will be fairly tranquil. If you're at the beach and you want to enjoy fun in the sand with your, your friends or your family, you're probably hoping that the waves aren't crazy um, strong, that the, the water's pretty tranquil. Unless you're there to surf or something and then you might be hoping for waves. But tranquil water is what you're seeing right here. It almost looks like glass on the surface. Vicariously is an adverb. A lot of adverbs end in L-Y, so that's just a little trick to help you remember them. And vicariously means experiencing something through another person. So if you can't be there, you might have to live vicariously through a friend's experience. Or if you can't do, so, if you can't travel to Europe, maybe you live vicariously through a writer who's written about an adventure in Europe. So oftentimes when you're older, you have kids, you kind of live vicariously through them, right? They have all these experiences you remember having, and you can't go to prom again, you can't do all these things they're doing, but you get to live through their experience and get excited for them and hear about their, you know, their adventures and their, their new experiences, and we live vicariously through our kids. Capricious describes anything that is any person who, who is subject to or led by sudden, unpredictable changes or whims. So someone who's capricious tends to be fairly spontaneous, right? So you might be sitting on the couch with a friend and if they jump up and they say, let's go to the beach or let's go to the movies and you haven't talked about it, they've just made a quick decision, they might be someone who's kind of unpredictable. They might, they might just kind of let their whims and desires carry them to wherever they want to go without really thinking too much about it. And so if you think about like the hippie generation in the 60s, they were very capricious and whimsical. Lots of them drove around the country, um, kind of from festival to festival, just kind of enjoying life, being very whimsical and capricious.